Hi, my name is Dave Zokowski, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about GNSS drives. This is going to be a short discussion on how important and how you estimate GPS drive heights. And this is being supported by the, the Geospatial Users Group out of Florida and the Florida Surveyors and Mapping Society. So I need to point out that I used to work for the National Geodetic Survey. Many people that are listening to this video may have seen me for years because I worked there for over 35 years. I was a director before I retired. But I believe that, you know, that what I'm still talking about now is, is important. But you've got to go to your NGS uh, regional advisor, and there's a website right here, for a real getting more specific and up-to-date information. I'm going to give you uh, material that is based on the, the latest information at this time, which this is in November of 2021, and things may change as you're going through. So you need to check the websites to be up to date on all of this. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about get an overview of the types of heights involved in establishing accurate heights. And many of you may already know a lot about this, but we're going to be dealing with orthometric heights, uh, lip site heights, as well as geoid heights. And I'll spend some time on the geoid heights. The difference between NGS's scientific geoid models and their hybrid geoid models, which there is a big significant difference, and most surveyors and mappers understand the, the hybrid geoid model, but they don't really understand the scientific geoid model, or what they call experimental geoid models. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to what's called the NAP GD 2022, or North American Pacific Geopotential Datum of 19, or 2022. Um, it's a big mouthful to say, but that's going to be the datum that's going to replace NEVD88. And finally, we'll talk about some basic concepts of estimating GPS dried orthometric heights in NAPG 2022. Will be a little bit different than what you're used to doing today. All right, first I want to start off with this diagram because this is very important. We're estimating um, GPS derived and ellipsoid heights. And by the way, I always say in GPS, at times when I should be saying GNSS, but I'm so used to a GPS because, you know, I've been doing this for 45, almost 50 years now. Uh, so if I say GPS, I'm really meaning GNSS. But anyways, you get this ellipsoid height that you have. The ellipsoid height equals, is perpendicular to this ellipsoid right here that you're seeing. Don't go like here. You got your geoid height that's relative to there, but then you have this orthometric height. And you'll notice these are, most surveyors understand this, the deflection of the vertical. But for all practical purposes, this is the equation right here that says approximately, it really is, for all practical purposes, is equal. But I'd like to show why this is curved in here. Now you can see this is the geoid. You got right there that blue line of the geoid. But this geoid is an equal potential surface. But there is an infinite number of equal potential surfaces from this point all the way up to this point. And I just drew a second one, and that means this line has to be perpendicular to, to that. And then if I draw, and I'll highlight that, now I draw it again, and you can see it has to be perpendicular. And you can see that they're not the same. These, now I've exaggerated it here, it wouldn't be that, that large, but I'm trying to show you that these, this geoid, if you will, and this equal potential surfaces, they're not the same as you go up, as you go up the, up to that point, they all were slightly different. But this line has to be perpendicular to that. That's why it's a curved surface, curved line going up to the top. And for all, once again, I want to emphasize though, for all practical purposes, they say that this equation, as you have right here, is equal. All right, now, it's important to perform good surveying practice to obtain accurate coordinates. I mean, I believe that most surveys understand this. They follow certain procedures. They look at guidelines and, and um, documents that maybe they've had for years. NGS puts, it, puts out guidelines. Um, but do you, what does it really mean to, to do um, good surveying practices? Users should follow adopted guidelines. Like in this case, NGS 58, NGS 59, and then what's called Opus Projects. If you're familiar with anything of NGS's products, you'll know that Opus Projects is one of their latest um, tools that they have out. But no document 58, and 50, known as NGS 58 and NGS 59, it's really a NOAA technical memorandum, both of them. And one is established the lip height heights, and one is established the ortho, NEVD orthometric heights. 
And these guidelines were, well, this, this one right here, the one with ellipsoid height, was, was out actually published in 1997. So the National Geodetic Survey is working on producing updates to this, but they have not created a newer one from that. But it is important that you, you go in and check their websites to continue looking for what is, because guidelines are modifying procedures, equipment, and models improve, as well as when the users. I remember when, and I can say I did this, because I was the main author of the GNSS derived ellipsoid -like guidelines. And I used to talk to the users. I'd go out there and I would set up a model and, and differences, and I'd say, okay, you have to observe for three hours uh, on, on two different days. Uh, and they would, and at different times of the day. And the user would come back to me and say, why do I have to do that? I just, I came out at 8 o'clock today, and I observed for four hours. I came back the next day at 8 o'clock and observed for four hours, and my answers agreed in millimeter. I said, but take it, now go out the next day and go at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or even 11 o'clock in the morning and do the same thing, and I bet it won't agree to a millimeter because the change in geometry affects you, the atmospheric checks you, the geometry of the, of the satellites, but the multipathing is affected. So that's why we talked about doing two different days, and you'll hear this, uh, observing them one day at a certain time and then go three hours later or so and observe again. The amount of time is shortened down. So when I was developing these guidelines, that's what we looked at. NGS is doing the same thing today with the latest information. So, they, so the point being that OPUS and NGS 5859 will be, eventually they will be updated. When? I don't know, but their NGS is modernizing the, the uh, National Spatial Reference System, and in there, their plans include modernizing this NGS 58 and 59. So they'll replace the, the NGS 58, and in reality, NGS 59, which talked about NVD heights, uh, won't even be necessary, because you won't be talking about NVD heights. You'll be talking about NAPG 2022 heights, or North American Pacific Geopotential Datum of 2022. 22 heights. So you can go down to this website, NOAA's website, uh, NGS, under NGS, and, and get all this information. But I do emphasize, NGS is always continuing to improve their beta, beta software, like this Opus project. So you should go out and get the latest uh, software and, and make sure that you, you understand. And that's, they, they highlight this on their homepage. Now, GOA models are critical. They are very critical due to doing any kind of GNSS-derived heights. Anybody can go out with guidelines and do, you pretty much can do your ellipsoid height, and if you modify your procedures, you can improve how your ellipsoid heights are done. The geoid model comes from somewhere else. Most surveyors can't create their own geoid model, so you have to, have to follow what's published, and that's what, what NGS has out with their, their geoid 18 model and their scientific hybrid or experimental geoid models, which I'll talk about. So really, What's a geoid model? I mean, that's a, it's a, not a very simple thing. It's pretty complex, it's very important to, to, to anybody that's doing any kind of GNSS heights, orthometric heights. But you can look at this diagram, and you can see that it's not a smooth surface. There's some highs and lows in here that when you look at this, because of what's inside, the density inside, what's mountains have a certain pull and a gravity will change, and you get into valleys, and they affect it differently. So it's not smooth. But I'll explain how you get to what you have. I like this, well, first of all, let me get into here the equipotential surface. What is the real definition of, a, of the geoid? It's the equipotential surface of the gravity field which best fits in the least square sense, global mean sea level. Well, first of all, how do you get global mean sea level? I mean, you go out to the oceans and you see that they got tides, everything goes up, they got waves, they got winds, they got hurricanes. So what does it really mean for global mean sea level? They have models for it, and they, they figure out this is what they think it is. You got tide stations that you measure local mean sea level, but that's not anything to do with mean sea level. It's local mean sea level, but global. So, anyways, it, it's it's all modeled. It's a mathematical function. But they, the the scientists believe that they have a very good and accurate estimate of what that really value is. You can't really have an instrument that you go down and you measure the geoid. It doesn't exist. Would be nice if it did, because then you could really have, wouldn't have to worry about um, this model and having errors and so forth. You can't dig down like these people are trying to do it. They're digging and trying to pull the geoid out through the uh, earth. 
The one thing you can do is that it can be modeled with gravity. A, the geoid has a relationship with gravity, so you can model the geoid. Now, there's lots, some other factors that go into this. You need global digital elevation models. They're very, very important, and some of the latest um, shuttle, well, now latest, in the early 2000, they did a, the shuttle did a, 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 a project that went around the globe, estimated getting the accurate heights uh, across the whole globe. So you have a global digital elevation model for the entire globe, which is what you need. When you do a geoid model, if you look at this geoid down here, and you see this, it's, you need information. Information over here is affecting information over there. So when you're standing here and you've got a mountain, this mountain's affecting what you are in your geoid. And if even around the other side of the, the globe, the world, it affects you. So all of these things have to come to play. So that global digital elevation model was very, very important. Now, local gravity data sets are probably the most important for when you look at doing your local surveys because if you've got a couple stations apart, the geoid should not change that grade over one or two kilometers. But if you start getting five or ten and you've got a mountain over here, it's going to have a slope. Without the local values, you can't determine how that's sloping. And global gravity data, data sets, and I'm going to explain this a little bit, but once again, the whole globe, everything around you affects your geoid everywhere. And so the more data you have around the globe, the better off your geoid model is. When I was at Ohio State University in 79, uh, Professor Dick Rapp was doing geoid models. And one of the best ones they had out at the time was called OSU-180. And it was giving things to 10 to 20 centimeters, but that was the best they had. And then before I left, they did 360. And today, those are so old and so inaccurate that the development, everybody knew you needed a better geoid model to do heights. But what they had back then, they didn't have this huge global Earth data. They didn't have these global satellite information. They didn't have all this global digital elevation. So they had to piece everything together. They had a lot of gravity data around the world, all based on some data, and they had to try to make it relative to the geoid model. But they did a fantastic job. But my point being, this is back in the 70s, and now you're, you're in the 2000s. In 2020, they, the, all these satellites. So in this, this era that we're talking about, um, in, in the, after 2000 on, when all these satellites were being put up to measure this, really enhanced. So you think about this, the global digital elevation models coming in after the years 2000 or not, it'll help really to improve it. And then these, these global satellites that were measuring gravity across the, the world also enhanced this gravity model, made it much, much better, much more accurate. This diagram, I know this is probably hard to see wherever you are watching this and on the screen, uh, but I like to point out, and this was done by Dan Roman, um, who's the chief geodesist of the National Geodetic Survey currently, but he wrote this, and this is several years ago, and, and some of their processes may have changed, and that's not what I'm trying to point out. What I'm trying to point out is that when you have the global digital elevation model becomes important. And if you look at this path, better elevation data and improved digital elevation modeling techniques give you much better uh, values towards your, your gravity because you can see that this, this, this values over here, this green part, they come in and they affect restoring a, the, the, the local gravity down here. So, they're all interrelated coming. So as we improve the better elevation, which we got from a lot of the satellites around the world, we improved how you can take and modify your local gravity value. Better gravity data, as well as improved geodetic techniques. More important, their GRAB-D, um, National Geodetic Surveys, uh, air, they, they're flying gravity, uh, using airborne gravity around the, in the United States and its territories to enhance this gravity field. But all that comes into effect there. But notice, in this case, like I said, this comes down in. This, the green arrow comes down into the blue and it gets, infected by it, gets affected by it. And then the last piece of this puzzle is these, the global gravity coefficients that come from your reference. So you got these satellites out there that take a, go around the whole Earth. And so now, when you, when you do a local gravity, you're right here and you're doing this local. And when you're doing a, a, um, the airborne, you're increasing your size, but you're still fairly local. But take the satellites, now it's the whole globe. 
And it takes a little So you need that, that over. And I'll explain that in a minute. So when you're building this gravity field, what do you do? You've got the long wavelength. So you've got these satellites. And this is Grace satellite. And it's a long wave from greater than like 250 kilometers. So you go around this globe. Every 250 kilometers, you're, you're getting something that you figure, I know the wave. In other words, it's not real close, but it's like 250 kilometers. You got an intermediate wavelength, which goes from, and this is an NGS slide, by the way, by Derek Van West from out of NGS. Uh, but I like the slide, so I'm using it, that it talks about the intermediate wavelength, which he says is 500 to 20. And it kind of fills in that gap. So you have something that you're laying the foundation on, and then you're going to do something in between. And lastly, you got your shore wavelength, and they say less than 100 kilometers. And in reality, you're trying to get even shorter than that. And that's where your local gravity does it so that you can fill in the gaps on that. And what this really means is, like this long wave, if you look at it, it's like this. All right? And if you look at this immediate, intermediate wavelength, it may be like this. And if you get to your local one, you may be like this. And then you overlay these things. And, and, and no, this is, this is only an approximation. Maybe my nodes aren't in the right place and my zero lines, but the concept's there. And then, then you take this short wavelength and you put that on here. All right, all this thing goes all the way around. Every piece of that is important. Every one of each piece of that. The long wavelength, the immediate, and the short. And that's what's giving you a very, very accurate uh, gravimetric geoid. All right. So now, let's talk a little bit about the long wavelength measure. This is the satellites. Um, the GRACE is what's called GRACE. Um, it's twin satellites. You can see right here there are two satellites that measure in between them. And that was one that was put up in, in 2002 for really trying to measure and understand the Earth's surface as well as the gravity, but other features on the Earth. That's what they were doing. And then that was in 2002. But in, in 2018, because they stopped GRACE around 2017, but the GRACE FO, which is follow-on, so GRACE follow-on, it was just another set of satellites that were following GRACE, so they just named it the GRACE follow-on. Follow -on. These are, like I said, they're twin satellites. You see them right there. And they just go around the Earth. And as it's going around the Earth, because of gravity, one of these satellites gets going a little bit further. And then this other one comes across and hits that same gravity anomaly, and it gets closer. And they're measuring the distance. So they measure the change in distance here, and then they measure it again. And that's how all that works. I'm going to explain that a little bit now. So this is how it works. So as I said, the pair of the, 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 uh, the satellites, they come across, and they go across this anomaly. And this one starts to pull away, so the distance increases. So they got something that's measuring that distance between those satellites. It's very, very accurate um, distance that they measure between these two satellites as it's moving. And so as this one moves and pulls away, it's measuring that. And as it comes closer again, it's measuring it again. So constantly measuring it. But they know that, so that gravity anomaly, whatever it is, is causing them to move. And this is going on as the Earth is moving around, these go satellites are going around. And inside, there's a uh, accelerometer that's measuring everything, the movement. So the, the, there's a lot of movements going on in these satellites, but the accelerometer will measure all that non-gravity, the movement due to non-gravitational effects. And that's really what's happening. And then they measure, using GPS, they measure the position of these satellites to within a centimeter or less. This is taken off the website, and that's just a kind of an amazing feat. No one will be able to position that to a centimeter, and they must have really accurate ways of being able to look at this data. They got lots of data over lots of different time uh, to be able to obtain that, but that's just an amazing feat that they're, they're doing. Although I'm not sure anybody could tell them that they don't know it to a centimeter level. But anyways, it's very, very good. They, do, they need the position of that satellite because so, they, they got this distance and they need to know what's going on with both of them. That helps them in that process. And then all this information is used to construct monthly maps of the Earth's gravitational field. So 
as you're doing this, and they measure it, they, the, the, the actual gravity field changes in the Earth. You know, if you get a lot more water in one area or something, it's going to change how that gravity is. And it's, they just map it and know they keep track of all that. But that's what that's for. And that's important because that provides the, the, the foundation for the long wavelength for the geoid model. Now, the, the intermediate wavelength, 500 kilometers to 20 kilometers, is done with the airborne gravity by NGS. This is in, in, in I'm talking about what's happening inside the United States right now. Um, other people around the world do something a little bit different, but this is what National Geodesic Survey does. So gravity, gravity for the redefinition of vertical datum. So the, the airplane does the same thing as the satellites, if you will. They fly around and they have instrumentation in there to be able to determine what the actual gravity is based at, at the airplane platform. And then they reduce that down to the geoid, just like they do with the satellites. But they have all these different instruments inside to take care of it. The point here that I'm trying to emphasize is they've flown um, about all of the United States and its territories. And this, is a, this is a June 2020 map. You can go up their website, which I labeled down here, and you can get this information, um, up-to-date information. But anyways, it's, it's, all this green is available data and metadata. So you can see all the green is actually done. The, the, or, the blue, if you will, is processed in there, the orange has been data collected is underway. So I don't know the status of it actually today, but like I said, it is changing as they able to do all more of it. But the point being, this is the medium or the intermediate wavelength. And the space-based data brings the long wavelength, as I showed you that, and this is bringing the intermediate, so it's just fitting on top. And then the short wavelength, less than 100 kilometers, how's that done? Terrestrial gravity data. Uh, you need, a, you need it all over the, the United States because uh, it's a local need. You, you actually need terrestrial gravity data around the world and NGS uh, has some. But your local area, your local fitting is based on what you have here. I want to point out a few things. One is the more gravity data you have, and this is a density map that you have in terms of the number of data points per kilometer squared. This is up at, uh, 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 up at 10. This is up to 10 to minus 1. So there's a lot. Uh, it means there's more gravity data here and less at, at down the bottom. And so what I wanted to highlight, as you can see, where you got some gravity data information there in, up in the north slope where all the oil and so forth is. But you also got a lot of gravity in a lot of these, a lot of these areas here. Um, and here, someone was taking a lot of gravity and they wanted to, to augment. But so you can see it's just not about oil and so forth. There's a lot of states that did did more gravity. In support of trying to improve the geoid model, some of these states actually took some of the local gravity to try to get improvement. And then the digital elevation model, uh, I mentioned about the, the shuttle taking all these heights, and this is the diagram you can see. The, in it, the more accurate you can get your digital elevation model, that, uh, the better you can reduce this gravity data. So you need both. And this is, so this data set, digital elevation, has really helped. And you can get more information about that down at this website I, I listed down here, more of the details. Now, NGS does these gravimetric geoids, they call them X-geoid models, and they're called experimental geoids. They've been doing them from 2014 to 2020. Every year they do, and this is a, a X-geoid 20 uh, that, that um, was their latest geoid model as of this November 7th, 7th 2021. And this is just a diagram of what the geoid looks like and what it covers. And you can see the geoid does cover a lot of this area. Uh, but this is where they have most of their information here and here. You can see little pockets. They don't have as much information down here. But it will give a value in that, that whole area. But point being, they, NGS does publish these annual experimental geoids. And these geoids are done because they need to, when they were moving towards doing this new modernized National Spatial Reference System, they needed a very accurate geoid model. So they started looking at how can they develop more and more accuracy to get it down to their, their centimeter level that they're looking for. So they're collaborating with others to look at how can I improve this geoid model as well as refining geoid computations methods. That All of this came to play. And they are working with the Canadian and the Mexicans. The latest geoid model, this XGOID 20, was a collaboration where they did work with Canada and Mexico trying to do one joint 
it. So it would really be one joint over this whole area that Canada and Mexico would be using the same geoid model. That's their goal. And really more important, these X geoid models provide um, an estimate of what the difference will be between your NAP GD 2022, the North American Pacific Geopotential Datum of 2022, how that compares with what was NEVD 88 and NGVD 29. The old, the, the current is NEVD 88, so you're going to get these differences. It's in, it's in planning for when all this comes out, and right now the scheduled date is around 2025. So the, the current uh, geoid model, I took the data, looked at it, and I plotted and did some contrast, try to show that hybrid geoid models are not real geoid models. Many people out there, the surveyors out there, they're using, they do a GNSS on the station, and they grab geoid 18, they apply it, and just like I did in that one equation, you get the height is equal to the lift slide height minus the geoid height, and there, you got your orthometric height using geoid 18, which is a NEVD 88 height. So it's a GPS-derived NEVD 88 orthometric height. But this geoid model right here, this, the gravimetric geoid, is not the same as the hybrid geoid model. The hybrid geoid model are really conversion surfaces. The, the geoid 18 conversion surface, it allows you to take your NAD 83 ellipsoid height, take that ellipsoid height, and allows you to apply this conversion to get, uh, um, well, uh, allows you to take your NAD 83 2011 ellipsoid height, apply this conversion to get a NEVD 88 height. So that's, that's what that surface is. And they are, they are not really a geoid model. So how do you get this geoid 18? Now, there's, many people may be familiar with this, this GPS on benchmark program that NGS has where surveyors went out, they would have a, a station that has a NED 83 2011 ellipsoid height and uh, an EVD 80 level height, and they would take that and then they would compute a geoid model. So, in other words, you can take, you can, you take your, um, the end, the north, or the, 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 your estimate of your geoid value is equal to your ellipsoid height minus the orthometric height. And so you can take that value you have and say, that's my new geoid height. So I get my geoid height, but I have a geoid model, and they're not going to be the same. So what happened was the, the hybrid geoid model, or geoid 18, is based on the gravimetric geoid, geoid model, X geoid 19B. Now I showed you a diagram of X geoid 20B. Well, the difference between X geoid 19B and 20B is very, very small, so it's basically the same contours. But that's not the point. The point is the foundation for geoid 18 was on this gravimetric geoid, geoid 19B. Surveyors needed uh, a lot of, like this GPS on benchmark, surveyors would go out and occupy a level benchmark at an immediate height. They'd occupy it with a GNSS-derived height. They'd occupy it, and that way they would get an estimate of the geoid height, and that, that would go into the model. And that's what all these, that's what all these dots are. There's 32,357 data values used in there. And some of these states you can see are, have a lot more stations involved in Florida, uh, South Carolina, my, I, li I live in North Carolina, it's North Carolina station's heavily populated, and you can see up in there that, that, that everybody was taken and trying to occupy to get better. Why? Because they wanted to get a better hybrid geoid model. You get out west and you get much sparser spacing out there, just because there wasn't as many, any VD heights, if you will, um, and it's just hard to, to be able to get what you, where you want the, the data values. So what happens here? You take your ellipsoid height from NAD 83 2011 and minus the orthometric height NAVD 88. And then you take that value and you subtract the model. That gives you residual. That gives you your difference between what, what you expect it to be and what it is. Now, when you do come up with geoid 19B, it's a gravimetric geoid. It's not going to be the same as your um, the, the, that residual, if you will. It won't be the same. There's going to be a bias and a tilt that's going to come, and that's part of the errors in the leveling system. So you, what you have to do is you measure that 
through co-location, you do very accurately try to model this difference. It's not just a raise or lower. There's a lot of similarity between coastal space stations. There's a, a relationship many times between coastal space benchmarks, and they use that information to be able to create a surface that gives you the best estimate of the, the difference between NEVD88 and that gravimetric geoid. So that's what they're trying to do, because they, the, they believe the gravimetric geoid is very, very accurate, but they know that the ellipsoid has some issues with it, and they also know that the orthometric height has some issues with it. So they know that they have both of the issues, with it, but they don't know how much they are. But they do know the gravimetric geo is pretty good. But what the user needs is something that if I occupy this with a GNSS, get an ellipsoid height, I want to be able to get an orthometric height. So they want that geoid model. So if you go out to the, this website right here, it's the technical page for geoid 18, they'll give you a lot of this information. And it, it, it's where when you computed this, like I said, they take the NED83, 2011 height, NED88, computer residual, and this is the conversion surface that you end up with. And you can see that it's slowly tilting this way, and basically down in here is close to uh, somewhere around the zero time frame, or zero um, centimeter level, and it increases going across up in here until it gets over, to, over a meter up in the, the northwest. And you can see that it's very systematic going that way. Now, I also look at this, you know, if you look at the heights across the United States, it starts very, very flat here. It kind of increases going that way, increases. So there could easily be some kind of height error in this NEVD88 level. You don't know. But it's very, very smooth going up there from the, the, the bias and tilt. But then there's all these bumps and wiggles that are inside here that you can see. It's not very smooth to cut up, but it does change. And partially that is due to some of the some of these NED83 2011 lip slide heights may not be as accurate as uh, some others. The NED88 heights may not be accurate as some of the others. They may have moved. The NED83 lip slide heights were done on a certain epoch, and the NED88 was done with a different epoch. So maybe in between, the station moved. So the, the height of the lip slide height and the height of the benchmark really can't be compared because they're not really the same, same location. They're the same monument, Mark, but if it moved, it's not actually the same one. And what, what did NGS do in there? They, they looked at stations that were relatively close. So if stations were like between uh, two centimeters and five centimeters, they said, you know, those differences ought to be pretty close to zero. And if something went from uh, about 10 kilometers, you start getting a little bit spacer, you start, well, let's make it three centimeters, we're okay with that. But then if it got a little bit further, then you got to allow a little bit more, like 50 kilometers. Because some of the western, there was some large differences, then you got to allow a little bit more in the western part of the state. But this was a criteria, and, and they looked at, I said there was over 32,000 stations, and they looked at all those stations to try to find out what was the best. Is the ellipsoid height good, and is the orthometric height good? If they are, then that's a valid entry into the geoid 18. But if they're not, then you don't want it because the gravimetric geoid is, is pretty smooth and consistent and shouldn't have large differences, especially over these short 5, 10, 15 kilometers. You're not going to see that huge a difference over 5 kilometers in the geoid. So this was the output. This is the residual map that comes from the, after doing all the work that they did, and you can highlight some of these, well, I will in a second, but you can highlight some of these down here where you have uh, large differences in this scale down here. That's about four centimeters and hits about six. This is in the, the Gulf Coast where you have some relative subsidence going on, so we know. So in that case, the, the subsidence, you got the heights, the leveled heights in the GPS may, or, may not be um, at the same epoch because one moved, but that's all you had down there because you'd used the, the best information that you had to do it. And up in here, you got a large difference, and over here, um, and some of these differences are due to, they had a data pull. When they did the, the, the pull for trying to analyze the data, they would pull data for the, the, um, the leveled heights, they would pull them out of the database at a certain time. They would pull out the latest, uh, uh, lip slide height, and they would do the match, and they would do the subtraction, and that's what the residual. 
Well, I think in these cases here, which I haven't investigated yet myself, except I did investigate one of them, it was the fact that they did a, NGS did a regional adjustment in that area and then superseded some of the older heights. And what happened was the data poll came out and then six months later, I think it was, maybe, maybe more like nine, NGS did this readjustment substitute. So the heights in the database, the NVIDIA heights, are more accurate because they removed this regional movement um, that they have. And this change, this blue change, you can look at here, it's somewhere approaching like in the six to seven centimeters, what you're having in, the, in those. And that's what was one of the changes in this adjustment. It removed uh, the heights all changed. So they made all the heights consistent in the area. So the heights, the relative height difference are good, but they changed everything by about that. That's what I suspect was part of what was in, in that. One final thought on this. This is the statistics overall fit coming out of G818. And so the, the standard deviation is what 1.27 centimeters or 1.3 centimeters, uh, which is an improvement. G818 is an improvement over G812, which was 1.7 centimeters. So there was a little bit of improvement. But that's what you have. That's your standard deviation. So that means that a lot of them were within 1.3 centimeters. But not all of them. And I'm going to show you some of, some of the outliers that were in there. This is Florida. 3,892 went into. These are GPS and benchmarks. And this is what was in the, the number was encoded in G818. There may be more now, but back, back when G818 was done, this was the number that was included. And the same idea what they did before. You take the GPS bench, you get the estimate of the G8 height, the ellipsoid height minus the work. This, that's all straight math, math, mathematics, ellipsoid minus orthometric. And then you model that. You have that estimate minus the geoid model. And then, like I said, they removed the bias and the tilt, but that's what you get. And I did it on almost 4,000 in Florida. That's a lot of benchmarks. Still a lot of open areas, but most likely nothing's really around there or something, or they would have had some. Now, on this map here, all these red dots, those were not used in the model. The green dots, they were used in the model. You can see the green dots are all, there's a lot, but the red, you can see a bunch of the red ones, they were used. Now, the criteria that if the ellipsoid height minus the, the orthometric height, if that value differed significantly with its neighbors, like I mentioned, within a couple kilometers, you had two centimeters. And so if that was different, that was investigated to say, well, which one's good and which one's bad? Was it old leveling and new GNSS? Or was it old leveling as well as old GNSS? So sometimes you had a large residual, you just didn't know. I'm going to explain a little bit about that. But this is what it looked like for the thing. So you can see there was a lot that were removed. There's another diagram that's very hard to see, I know, but um, the point being, uh, what I wanted to show was in some of these numbers, the statistics over here in that model, for in Florida, there was 3,892, but the minimum value was a minus 17 centimeters and the maximum was over 41 centimeters. Now they weren't coded, those large numbers were not included in the model, they were removed. But that's some of the stuff that you, the, the, the NGS was looking at when they saw this. They saw these large differences, so they had to remove them. They didn't want to distort it, because clearly something went on. Either benchmark moved, or maybe it was a bad ellipsoid height. Sometimes you, you don't know. Sometimes the ellipsoid heights um, were done real early on, and they, their height component may not be as accurate as the later things. So now, if you look at this, these are all the residuals that are between plus or minus two and a half centimeters. Now, you Remember, the standard deviation was 1.3 centimeters, basically. So I just did two and a half centimeters, and I, you can plot them. And you can look at this and see that there's quite a few that are, have been used. And um, some of them that have a, in between plus and minus two centimeter, uh, they weren't used, but they're still in there. And they're still valid, but they weren't used for some one reason or another, which I will show you one in a minute. But my, what I was trying to show here is there's 3,200 of them that are between plus and minus two centimeters. And they're evenly distributed basically across. That's part of what I wanted to kind of show, that the, the plot. I mean, I could have given you a table of all these numbers with a spread, 
But I like, I'm a visual guy. I like to see that plot. I like to see just where are they? Are they all in one corner? Were they? But they're not evenly distributed throughout the project. These are residuals that are greater than plus or minus two and a half centimeters. And these are included those really large outliers I showed you, 17 centimeters and 41 centimeters. And so, once again, all these, these appear to be evenly distributed. These aren't just all in one area. They're evenly distributed. It means that some of these were large. And when I say large, greater than two and a half centimeters. Because you can see some of these down here, a, little, a lot of them at three centimeters, and these are a couple right here at two or three. So they're not extremely large, but they're larger than basically two of the standard errors, what I was looking for, plus or minus two and a half centimeters. But it's evenly distributed throughout, just like the other. So there's no pattern to it. And now, now I want to look at, you know, an example. This is, this is a, the, P, the PID, permanent identifier, a BE2123, this station. And it's right there. It's 15.3 centimeters. It wasn't included. That's an X. So it was not included in the model. So it's not being affected by the model. That's why the residual is large. But it's old leveling data. The data level is 1977 to 1979. This is old GNS data back in the 1989 to 1993. And so that was really, really old back in Florida. It was in one of the beginnings that did a lot of that, that survey. As well as the difference greater than three centimeters over 10 kilometers. So this area here, so that was, oops, one second. That was in an area where you have some agreement and that station just stuck out. And it said 15 cents too large, so they rejected it. So we're not going to use this in, in this. So I want to I want to highlight where where you can get NGS can get this information uh, from from well where the surveyor can get this information about any one of these stations um, in out of NGS's database. So I'm going to go over here for a second to hook up to if this works right. There we go. So. This already got set up to NGS's homepage, and if you if you take this, go to the homepage, you come down to the beta release passive mark page right there. So I'm going to I'm going to click on that in a minute, um, and I want to note that this is a beta re release. And that's that's now, but you have to check and make sure that that eventually that could, hopefully that'll become a product and it will no longer be in a beta, but it'll be in their products, marks, and tools. Uh, so I'm highlighting here because it's still under beta at, this, at the time of this, doing this webinar. So if, if I, when I click on that, which I'm gonna push this button because it, there's a, a lag between when it comes in or not, so I've already stored that page. Now I enter in the, the station, the, the, it's BE2123, so I go in and enter that in that PID, you just type it in, and then you hit that button about saying get data, and then this pops up. And this gives you the station name, tells you the designation, tells you last recovered, gives you, let me blow this up a little bit. It gives you the PID, but it gives you the stability, GPS usable, the orthometric, and you know, by the way, GPS usable, just because it has a GPS usable, Says, says yes, um, doesn't mean that it is today. It was sometime. So whenever you're doing a survey or you want to, you, may, you best go out there and make sure that they didn't put up a building next to that station or, build, put a, a, or a tree grew up. So you need to check that. Anyways, as you go through, this gives you the orthometric height, it gives you the order in class, gives you the, the geoid height, ortho, the, the GNS drive orthometric height, and then it gives you this, this residual, this difference, if you will, between this orthometric height and, and, and the, the, let me point this out, hold on. So the GNS height is equal minus the NABD height times 100. That's what that number is. So all this information is available in, in, in reality. So you can take any one of your PIDs that you have if you're interested. A couple things. One is, um, was it, does it have a, a, a GNSS height and does it have a leveling height? If it, if it has both of those, then it should have this orthometric height residual populated. But also, 
you go down, it gives you a nice diagram of where the station is that you can look at. This is a great tool, by the way. It tells you a little history about the station and, and stations nearby. In case you, in case you, you, that station may not be there, it'll tell you what's nearby. If you can't find it, you can find some other one. But what I was looking at and what I use this a lot for, gives you all the superseded values, but here, it tells you when it was leveled to last, who did it, and the date. It tells you if it's on more than one GPS project, like in this case, it was on 1989, first one. The second was 1993. Uh, all that information is part of, of what you have, setting agency, stamping. Gives you all this. So it's getting all the data sheet, and it's trying to give this data sheet information in my opinion, in a little bit user manner. I think they did a nice job of this. And it'll work with any PID you have. And if it doesn't have to be a level, or even a, um, both GNS and level, it's any PID. If it's got a PID, it, whatever's in the database will come out, the NGS's database will come out that way. Uh, anyways, I think that's a good tool, and I'd like everybody to know about that tool. Okay. So now we're back. We're, so anyways, looking at that site that you have right there, and stuff. That's where I was getting all that information from. But you can do it for any mark that you want. Now, I want to show this other monument, other state, because this PID, which is BE3955, the date of the level was 1991. The date of the GPS was 1989, which is old. But look at the residual. You can't really see that very well, but the residual is 0.5. Five millimeters. But the station's not used because it was a no-check station. In the early time of GPS, back when people really were more focused on doing the horizontal than the vertical, because the geoid model wasn't as accurate as it is today, there were a lot of um, baselines. That a person, when they were doing their, their project, they would hang a, a, a just do one station. They'd occupy this station when they're occupying the other one. But they'd only occupy one vector, and that's basically no-check. They wanted to get the height, they wanted to get an idea of the height of it, but they weren't, they weren't going to publish that height. The people that were doing it were interested in the horizontal part of it, not the vertical part. Um, but it was hanging out there. That's really a no-check station. And sometimes you have that in this NAD 83 2011 where it had a bunch of, may have had more observations, but so maybe it had an observation here, an observation there, but all of a sudden one was rejected. So now you're left with a no-check. So you can't trust that ellipsoid height when you're doing it. It had old leveling data in this sample, it's at 1991. Old GPS, GNSS data at 1989. But the key is, the key is, it was a no-check station. And they were eliminated right from the beginning. Even, I, I think, I don't know for a fact for sure, but I'm pretty sure all of them were removed in the beginning. If there was an area that was really totally void, maybe it was considered. I don't know. Okay. So, the G818 convergence, what, is it, what does this really mean? The figure shows it's a conversion surface, okay? So it will take the difference between NAD83, the datum, and a geopotential geoid, okay? That's what that surface shows you. But it's, it's the difference between AD and that, 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 that geometrical surface. So it's called a hybrid geoid, but in reality, it's a conversion surface. It's not a geoid. The difference between the hybrid geoid and the gravimetric geoid is geoid 18 minus that. So in other words, this is really considered geoid 18. So if, if the figure represents 88, the datum, and the geopotential surface, and it also represents between 18 and 19, it tells you that geoid 18 is not a geoid, okay? It's a convergence rate, which is okay. I just, it's one of my pet things that the hybrid geoid gets confusion with some people that they think they're dealing using a, a real gravimetric geoid. And last, and I mentioned this several times, it has three essential components. There's a bias that you have. The NAV data was held up at Father Point up in here in Ramuski and in, in, in actually in Canada. And so if you look and basically look at that difference, it's somewhere around 30 to 40 centimeters up there in, between the two. And that's what they believe is the difference between what they're calling global mean sea level and that local mean sea level because the NAVD 88 held that uh, the height, the geopotential or the potential height of that station at that local tide gauge 
in Canada. That's what was held as a constraint, just one, one point in the NVD88. So that's a bias between what they're saying is the global mean fuel oil, which is no problem. That means you raise or lower it. And then it's this tilt that we believe that it's, in, and everybody believes that it's in the leveling data, um, it's systematic tilt going up from the south east, going all the way up to the north east, and then going up to the, the northwest and the heights, just basically systematic trend. I just think it looks so similar to the change in elevation in the United States. It's something that's to be dealing with heights. As far as I know, they haven't found anything though. Okay, and the last little part about it, and well, you can hard to see probably, but all these little bumps and wiggles that you have in here, those are due to the fact that that's the local change um, due to the ellipsoid height and the orthometric height. It's, it's, the, it's, the war, it's a warping of it, basing it to fit these, these differences. That geoid doesn't go and do make all these little undulations ships in that thing. That's due to the, the warping of it, of the, due to the, the ellipsoid height minus the orthometric height. Okay, so using the hybrid geoid model, okay, in NEVD88, this is that diagram I showed you. If you're not down in southern Louisiana, you're going to have some large differences. Up in this area here, there are going to be some large differences. Um, and in these cases here, if the, if the ellipsoid height is good and the orthometric height is good, then the NEVD88 height there you have is, is, is the good one. But if one of them is bad, and that movement's due to some bad movement, then the geoid model should be better than that. And I'll show you this in a second. So what I'm trying to get is, what, what does it really mean to work with geoid 18? So here's an example in this area in, in Florida. And you can see, I highlighted this, this, this area here. And it says that almost 10 centimeters difference between the two stations, which are 10 kilometers apart. So if you look at here, this between here and here is about 10 centimeters over about 10 kilometers. Now, these two marks were not used in, in the geoid 18 model. They weren't used. But the question you have to have is, okay, I'm in there, I'm in this area, I sit at my receiver, and I'm right near this station, say, that wasn't used. I'm there, and I get an ellipsoid height, and I used geoid 18. It's going to be different than that benchmark. So NGS made a decision that that benchmark wasn't rep truly representing a change in the geoid model, but that means that what that could be indicating is, hey, that monument moved. Either the leveling monument moved or the ellipsoid height was not, wasn't um, accurate enough in between. So in other words, the leveling may have been done, like I said, in some of those other ones in, in 1970, and then all of a sudden the GPS comes in in 2000, and they don't, they don't agree. Well, the leveling could have moved, or you could have a bad ellipsoid height. And that's the analysis they went on. But that's something that when you go in there, you have to be careful. And you should be, if it was me, and I was going in the area, I would go in and I'd do something here. I'd try to find out what that GEOID 18, if I'm going to use GEOID 18 as my end result, I'd try to find out if I got some significant differences. So another slide dealing with similar type, not as large. These stations are six kilometers difference over about five kilometers, so you can see that's like minus, or that's 3.5 centimeters, and minus two, minus two. So you got a bunch that are in this area right here that are, they agree with each other, but they differ by about five centimeters, the relative difference here. And they were all used in the establishment of geoid 18. That's because they couldn't find if there was something bad with the left side height or bad with the orthometric height, and it wasn't that, wasn't that large. It was something, and if you took that out, then you'd have a bigger gap there, and you got like 2.8 there, minus one, so it's kind of moving around. I mean, you could, have moved, you could have removed as many marks as you want to make it look good, but then you're down to just picking what you want the surface to look like. So this is a reality. This is the best you can do with trying to get a, a hybrid geoid model out of ellipsoid heights and orthometric heights. That's sort of what I was trying to, trying to get at. So, this is a slide I got from NGS's library to try to say what, what, is, what is the hybrid geoid model. And this is what it says, a hybrid geoid model. And you look here, it says equal approximate NEVD88. So it's really giving you an approximation of NEV88. And that's what those numbers are telling me. 
When I look at those numbers, I'm not getting back to, I'm not getting back to that benchmark, although they could have made it that way, could have made it directly back to it. But at least in this hybrid geoid, it's giving you an idea of what seems to be, uh, um, what seems to be a valid ellipsoid heart or a valid orthometricite, trying to give you an idea that that might, may have moved. So you want to be careful about that, which I think is a good, good idea. But I want to highlight, it's approximate NEVD88. Not exactly. This is the gravimetric geoid right down here. And this geoid, the hybrid geoid model, is based on your ellipsoid heights, if you will, and the orthometric heights. Both of them are being, and it takes and changes this, this model to come in and try to best fit with the, the, with the difference between the ellipsoid height and the orthometric height. So it's, it's, if you will, it's taking this geoid value and changing it, changing the value of the scientific geoid model or the gravimetric geoid model. So now, what about the new vertical datum 2022, NAPGD 2022? What's really going to happen? We've talked a little bit about this, but it really is just you're going to have your, your orthometric height you're going to determine is using the ellipsoid height minus the geoid height. And that's what, what NGS is creating is they're creating these terrestrial reference frames where you're going to get your ellipsoid height and then the geoid 2020 where you're going to get your geoid height just like the, the, the x geoid values it had but it creates these these values so you're going to they're going to give you're going to do that you're going to get this when you're, you're surveyed they're going to give you that and that's going to be your orthometric height so the orthometric height in nap gd 2022 is equal to your ellipsoid height in one of the terrestrial reference things minus the geoid height, which is geoid 22. And just going to give you that. You're going to compute that. And then this is what you're going to, or you're going to observe this. And then this is what you're going to end up with. So NAP GD 20, 2022, what's really important is it's a, this geopotential datum is going to give all these different par, um, uh, products. But what's important to you when you're trying to do GNSI's heights is geoid undulation, the geoid 2022. That's important for estimating heights. All these other ones are going to be useful to surveyors, acceleration of gravity, geopotential number, deflection of vertical, all of that. But when you're doing heights, this is one which you're going to want. So now, I want to point out the, that NAPGD 2022 is going to have a time-dependent component. Just like the horizontal part of this, of uh, NATREF and the, the California or the Pacific PATREF uh, terrestrial reference frame, all of these that they're going to have, they're going to have a time dependent component. So it will change. And if you look at this diagram, and what you see is this is small numbers. This is like a 1.25 millimeters negative. This is 1.5 millimeters. This is per year that you see this change. And what do you see? What do you have? You got a, up in this area here, you got a large value and large changes what are going on, which is up above the, the millimeter per year range. You got someone over here, which is in the, the Hudson Bay area, which is always known as 1.5 millimeters a year. So those are significant changes that you're going to see over large areas. I personally am looking at this and seeing this, and I have to talk to someone about this, because I'm looking at that thinking, what is that? What's that difference for? I, I just didn't expect when I saw this diagram, which came from, by the way, out of their NOAA Technical Report, NOS NGS 64, which re was revised in February 2021. And by the way, that's the, the current as the date of this video. Um, you need to go out to NGS's webpage to see if there's any more updates on that same document. But I don't know about this right here, and I'm trying to find out more about what that is. And that's just showing me somewhere between a half a millimeter and a millimeter movement per year, which is significant. Okay. So once again, the NAP GD 2022 at a certain epoch is equal to the, the ellipsoid height at one of these reference frames at a certain epoch minus the GOA 22 at that epoch. Now obviously the epoch's the same, but they're all going to change. The geoid model is going to change the least amount, but it is going to change. And it's going to, this will be transparent to you. NGS will make this transparent in the process. So NOAA Tector Report 64, which was updated in 2021 here, February 2021, once again, you need to go out on the website and see if they've done another update, because they're, 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 these are living documents that they're trying to get to tell what's the basis of all the policies and procedures and what decisions are made. And the same thing here about the 
up in the, the different routine. Well, let me go back for one second, I'm sorry. This is a change between NAPGD 2022 and NEVD88 from their report. And they got it nice and smooth coming through with that, the, the differences here. And you can see they got some more wiggles and so forth. It's kind of hard to read, so I'll show you something in a minute. But this is Alaska, where they did the difference going basically up in, the, in this area. I did my own. I did this based on all my GPS and benchmark files. I downloaded all those files, converted them into what I think would be the NAP GD 2022 values. And then I looked at plotting them and doing the residuals and so forth. And you can see, this is a 15 centi centimeter condor, but you can see that there's a lot of local changes that are gonna be captured. So it's not a smooth surface. It is not gonna be nice and smooth. There'll be a lot of bumps in there. So you need to understand that when you go to do that, it's not going to be just a little biased in an area. It is going to be some significant changes. So this is in Florida, NAP GD22 and NEVD88 in Florida, the difference based on things. You can see down here, you got somewhere around 10 centimeters. You got a zero line going through here, and then it goes up to 30 centimeters up here, and it starts coming back to 20. That's the difference that's going to be between NAP GD22 and NEVD88. Now, I, I was the project manager for the North American Vertical Datum 1988. And so when I was out giving a talk one time, after the new reference frames were being put out, i have been told, hey, we're going back to NGVD 29 now. And I said, no, you're not. This is the difference between NAP GD 2022 and NGV 29. And you can see that there is no real zero from a, except when you get up in here, that's one zero. You get up in these mountains here, and you're up at a, over a meter in the mountains because they use normal gravity in NGV29 and they use real gravity in NVD88 as well as NAP GD2022. So, what's it looking for that? The between the 29 and that, you can see right down here, minus 40 centimeters, and it goes all the way up to about minus 20 up in that, that area there. So, you can see it's still not going to be zero. You're going to have some significant differences in there, but it won't be zero. So you're not going back to 29. So let's review some of the major points. Users should follow adopted guidelines. That's a pretty obvious one, but having these guidelines and, and users should contact NGS and look at their web page to really find out what's the best they have. Because remember, all these guidelines detect, reduce, and eliminate error sources. Okay? But guidelines will be modified as new techniques and policies come. They will be modified. So you need to keep checking for that. Hybrid geoid models are not the same as scientific experimental geoid models. I'm not sure how many times I can say that, but hybrid geoid models are not real geoid models. Hybrid geoid models are really convergent surfaces. We should stop calling them geoid models, but that won't happen. There'll be a significant difference in values between NAP GD22 and the reference datums. Um, in the NAP GD 2022 or GNS derived orthometric heights will be determined using GPS, ellipsoid heights, and the geoid heights. So that's what you're going to do. That's what you're going to be computing. The geometric terrestrial frame will have a time dependent component, and so will the geopotential datum, which we talked about. NGS is developing models and tools to facilitate user transition to the new reference frames, enhancements to OPUS routines, coordinate transformations, transformation to NCAT, all of these things are going to be done by NGS and will be um, available to the user. So I want to give you one final thought, and this is from a very intelligent individual. Well, at least he, he believes in, he's my brother. My brother and I try to get together a couple times a year. He goes way out west, and so we get together, and we travel and just go see places. So. What he said to me one time is, if you geodesists did it correctly the first time, you wouldn't have to keep performing adjustments and changing values. Just do it right the first time. He's a doctor, so he's can't, he can't get away with making mistakes. Now, my answer to my brother, life is a continuous process of adjustment. If you're going to do something better, you have to change. Now, you assume the change you're making is doing something better, but yes, that's what you have to do. So, I want to thank you all for listening to this and support of the Geospatial User Group, as well as the Florida Surveying and Mapping Society. I appreciate them taking the time to, to do this video and to help with um, surveyors and mappers understand about the new reference frames. 
I want to, one final thing. Geodesy provides the foundation for all geospatial products and services. Wherever I go, I always try to say that. I don't want anybody to forget. Because, I mean, people walk around now, these young kids walk around with their cell phones and they, they know where they are, but they have no idea that geodesy was the only reason they got to where they are. So I like to harp on that. So that, I appreciate it. Thank you.